Hi, this is Gavin. In this video I'm going to explain how to date whether a, a golf iron with a wooden shaft dates to around 1900 or 1800. So this first one, they're all smooth faced. They're what's called nicking at the top of the hosel. So that's those little points there. The nicking is quite fine and it's quite regularly spaced. That indicates it's not as old as some of the others. And with a lot of this, it's only when you put one club next to each other that it seems to make sense. So if we look at the top line of the face, it's probably three to four millimeters wide um, in inches. Hmm, what's that? About uh, an eighth of an inch, something like that. So not very wide, really. So it's very much a case of comparing one to the other. So if we look at the next one, we can see that the hosel length is still about the same. In fact, it's almost identical. And I dare bet that that would be about three and a half inches. Now you can see this little here, the join between the hosel and the blade, that's actually um, got a little curve in there. And if I look at these four clubs, so that's that one, that one, that one, and that one, they all have a similar characteristic just there. But if I go to this one, then it becomes a sharper. It's almost a complete 90 degrees. And this one was sharp, but it's almost can fool people because it's got a little bit of oxidation there, which makes it look a little bit more curved. But then you go back and back, again, sharp. Okay, so let's look at the thickness of the top of the blade. So this is actually thicker than this one here. But then again, this whole blade is bigger than this one. So this one has been um, hammer forged out and the metal has been spread out over a larger area. Therefore, it is going to be thinner. Okay, so as, again, we're talking in sort of general rules of thumb here. It's when you put all these characteristics together that it seems to make sense. So thinnish, thinnish, very thin, thinnish, thinnish again, but again, it's a large blade because it's a lofter. And then as we go back, a bit thicker, a very thin one, but with a very big blade, until we get to this one, which is um, getting on for nearly half an inch across there, which is extremely thick. So if we look at the nicking going through, again, quite small nicking, quite small, getting a bit further apart, probably the same as the last one. Then we're getting quite a lot further apart and it's very irregular patterns. You can, because this is put in with a, a chisel where certainly in clubs um, from the 20th century, wooden shafted clubs, they would have been put in by a machine at that stage. And then you get back to these very old ones where on this one uh, here, um, it, the points are very sharp, sharp enough that if you run your finger there, it, it will catch your finger. And similarly with this one. Now this one, they've been sort of just slightly chopped off, but they're very wide apart and they're very long in comparison to even this one here. One of these irons is unique in that this one here, the oldest one, has actually the hosel pin running from front to back, where every one of these else has the hosel pin running from side to side, which was the normal accepted practice, certainly from uh, about the 1840s onwards. If we look at the thickness of the shafts, most of these here could be considered to be the same. Some are slightly thinner than others, and a lot of that 
might be down to the ground the golf was played on, if it's sandy or a bit muddier, an inland type course. So you're talking the, the difference between St Andrew's links and, and Bruntsfield in the middle of Edinburgh. But if you go to this one, the shaft is um, getting on for near, just slightly under an inch wide there. And that's extremely thick. They're all actually hickory. There are some clubs that date very early that uh, have ash shafts. And the next thing is to look at the markings on any of these clubs, what we call clique marks. So if we look at this club and we turn it over, there's no actual maker's marks. Possibly these marks here going down and down possibly could be the, the remains of a stamp but uh, without looking really closely under magnification not too sure but i don't actually keep this club because of its head i actually keep this club because it's got an all-in-one cork grip which i quite find interesting anyway so the head is nothing special. Now, quite a few years ago when I was new to collecting, I, I, I'd I bought perhaps about 50 hickory clubs and I started getting quite interested in the irons. And then one day I, I, I came or I found a club that was smooth faced, no, no lines or dots. And I got really excited and I thought, wow, this is really old. And I digged out the normal reference books and I was thinking, crikey, this could be 1850s. What I didn't appreciate at the time was that smooth face clubs kept on being made and sold right up to 1920, something around that date. And it was only after a while, again, when I put all the pieces together that I realized that the, the iron um, wasn't that special at all. It, in fact, it was really quite a budget iron. And that's maybe why it had a smooth face and that it would cost that just a little bit less to produce and you know could be sold for cheaper. But anyway, a lot of these things, you, you might read in a textbook and it says, uh, okay, so you've got to look at the, the length of the hosel. And it might say that a, a club from 1900 might have a three and a half inch hosel and something of an earlier date might have a four inch hosel and something earlier from that might have a five inch hosel. All these things are true, but generally true. It's when you put the little bits together of the puzzle that you can really truly date an iron. So this club here dates, I would say, about 1910. This club here has the markings of R. Forgan and Son, St. Andrews, and the three feathers mark. Now this feathers mark signifies that it was made before 1902 when Forgans were the appointed club makers and held a royal warrant for Edward Prince of Wales. When Edward became king in 1902, Forgan started stamping his clubs with a crown. So that is a pre-1902 Forgan iron. I would say it's actually probably about 1895. Again, what I'm looking at is the overall shape thickness of the blade, the length of the hosel, how deep the nicking is, how regular the nicking is, how heavy the whole club is. It's all these things put together that help to date it. This again is a Forgan and Son iron. You can just see the stamp 
it has the three feathers mark just next to the bottom of the club. But this club is more lofted than the last club and hence why it has a slimmer top line on the blade. So if you were only going by top lines, you'd say this is thinner, therefore it's younger than the club before it. But there's other little things in terms of the thickness of the hosel that say to me that this club probably is slightly older than this club. Now we're looking at this iron that was made by Anderson of Anster. And Anster is spelled A-N-S-T-R-U-T-H-E-R. So some people pronounce it Anstruther, but I'm reliably informed that the correct pronunciation is Anster. So it carries the half inch circle mark. So in a very fine letterings, there's Anderson Anster, and then it's encapsulated or around the edges, there's a half inch circle. And a lot of the clubs on Anderson irons, sorry, a lot of the stamps on Anderson irons are very, very faint. It wasn't helped as well that caddies of that period they would clean clubs using a piece of very fine sandpaper and a bit of spit. And that over time did wear the markings. The hosel is still actually what I would call relatively curved. The hosel join between the blade and the hosel. The next club I'm going to discuss is this iron by Anderson of Anster. These two clubs were made by Anderson of Anster, but the one on the right was made as early as 1850s, and the one on the left was made, I would say, 1880s. They're different types of clubs. So this is a lot more lofted than this one. But if we look at the length of hosels, on the earlier one, it's half and half to three quarters of an inch longer. There's a key difference as well when we look at the marks on the back of the clubs. Now these are extremely faint anyway, but the one on the left has an outer circle just opposite my finger. The one on the right, there's no outer circle and the little dash mark that's in the center is running in a different direction. It's running from the top line of the face to the bottom line, where on this club here, it runs from the toe to the heel. And what I've noticed, when, um, as I've found a few really early Andersons, is that the ones they were making in the 18, late 1850s, 1860s, I, I don't think it's absolutely known when they first made golf clubs, but I think it was about 1859. Their early mark, they all carry this early mark where the, the little dash runs in a different direction. So they're both Anderson of Anster. This here is a clique in terms of the actual type of um, iron. So very little loft, about 19 degrees, something like that. It's actually got a very crude set of nicking. In fact, it's so sharp that actually if I push my thumb on that, it would dig in. You can just see as I turn the club that this isn't perfectly round. Every tine, as we call these points, is a sort of surface in itself. A small indication that this is hand forged work. There's no name on this head. 
So whoever made this, it's lost in the mists of time. I would say this is about 1850s. The last but one club has a very big head and it's actually dished. So now we're getting right back. I would say this is 1820s, 1830s. The tines are very crude and also what you can see is a slight bulging before it dips into the wood. And that's because these tines were formed by a cold chisel and then they were hammered in right at the tips so that it would clench the wooden shaft. One thing I've not mentioned so far is on a lot of early irons you will see the hammer weld and I'll come to that on particularly on the next head. You don't see it on every iron even though it is there if it was hand forged. And what that means is, is that the head was forged by one rectangular piece of metal and then one half of it was rolled up into a tube and bent and that's what forms the hosel. The shaft on this is remarkably thin. I really don't know how it survived almost two centuries. Now we come to my oldest iron and just holding it you feel the weight in this. So it's almost an inch across at the top of the hosel. You can see the wood colour change there and that's where actually you were moving from heartwood to sap wood something you wouldn't see on a much younger club it's pinned front to back a very good indication of an early date i was talking earlier about the hammer weld you can see the hammer weld there and you can clearly see it there it's at least a quarter of an inch probably more across the top line. The shaft is very thick and the grip is a sort of sheepskin and what you can also see is markings where it's had the twine wrapped going the opposite way all the way down the shaft, uh, the grip, cross stringing as it's called. So very early, impossible to say but could be as early as late 1700s. So if we just run through all these clubs, so let's just run through all these irons to date them. This one, 1900 to 1910. This one, 1890 to perhaps as late as 1900. This one, 1880 to 1890. This one, about 1875 to 1885. This one, 1860, possibly as late as 1870. Somewhere between 1840 to 1860. 1820 to 1840, late 1700s to 1820. Thanks for watching. 